Hey, 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 what's up, guys? We haven't touched Flat Earth in a hot minute, so why not do that today? Also, this fan art is pretty cool, isn't it? Shout out to Dutch Guy with a Toaster for the amount of detail put into this. But you know, this image here is the ultimate proof that the Earth isn't flat, but the Moon is. <laughs> Alright, anyway, we're going to be talking about gravity today. For some reason, I've been getting a lot of Mr. Thrive and Survive videos in my feed, so guess what? We're going to tackle his videos. Yay! Here's one I found called Gravity Destroyed in 10 Minutes. Wow, I can't wait to see someone debunk one of the most well established physical concepts. Concepts. This is going to be great. If I was able to give you a formula that was able to determine exactly what would happen in a shadow some of the time, but not all of the times, would you take that formula and just go blindly about and say, hey, if you do this with a certain object and you put a light at a certain angle using this formula, it will always come out to look like this. But not always. Let's just say maybe under the right perfect conditions it'll work, but Eh, you know, there, there's so many exceptions, you really can't use the formula. Would you actually stake your life on that formula? Would you call it a great formula? Many mathematical equations come with conditions. Some assume certain variables are constant, some assume the conditions are constant, and some are not 100% accurate but give us good predictive capabilities. But those are explicitly stated within the definitions of those said formulas. Let me give you a few examples. The ideal gas law assumes that gases are ideal, which means gas laws are obeyed and molecules have no interactions between each other. The second law of thermodynamics assumes an isolated system. Ohm's law assumes that resistance is constant. Hardy-Weinberg's equation assumes a large population where mating is random. What do you see from these examples I've listed. Yes, some of them assume something specific, and if that condition is met, then the equation is always correct. Others, like Hardy-Weinberg, is useful in giving us predictions of scenarios even if it doesn't exactly predict them itself. And this is a nuance that only people exposed to science can really understand. So as you can see, there are plenty of different laws. Some are always true, some are true if an assumption is met, and some aren't 100% accurate, but give us good tools of predictive capabilities. Going by the title of your video, I assume you're talking about gravity here, so let's see what you have to say. I'd be surprised if you were able to debunk every single equation that describes gravity, since gravity is a large topic that encompasses many subtopics of physics. And I'm talking about light and shadow here. See how light and shadow has created the illusion of a man's face? Well, that is exactly what gravitation and gravity and all that bunk has created. It has created the illusion that the masters that run this world in high places have wanted you to believe. That is such a bad analogy. <laughs> oh, God, I'm cringing for you. Check this out. Duncan McNeil, Mr. Thrive and Survive. Here's the formula for gravity. F equals GM over big M divided by R squared, or R raised to the second, seems to work. Hmm, does it now? Yeah, it does. That's an equation that gives us the force of gravity between two objects. And as we know, the more massive the object, the more gravitational pull it has on its surrounding objects. This force also depends on the object it is pulling, since it itself has its own gravity, and that's what this equation depicts. It is dependent on the gravitational constant, the masses of the two objects, and the distance between them. It's very, very straightforward. Oh, but I would love to see how you would debunk this very well-established equation. Oh, yes. Let's take a look at how hilarious this is. Force... Okay, uh, without even getting into these, what is this r squared? Huh? What is this right here? That's the radius of the r squared. That is an assumption that cannot be proven. You've got to be kidding me. That's not the radius of the Earth. R is the distance between the two objects of interest. Welp, you better find another part of the equation to pick on since distance is not anything hypothetical or unproven. Look, the equation here doesn't just describe Earth. It describes the gravitational pull between any two objects. So you could do the Earth and the Sun, or the Earth and the Moon, or the Sun and the Moon. You could even use this equation for very tiny objects, but their masses would be too minuscule to contribute to the overall gravitational force. Anyway, the video gets much better, so let's continue. So let's take a look at the formula of gravity, shall we? Well, if you do a Google search, you will find that this is also the formula for gravity. Uh, and you'll also find that this is the formula of gravity. All right, it's too bad you're too lazy to do even one Google search to find out what those equations mean. Like I mentioned earlier, there isn't just one equation for gravity. Gravity is a large topic that includes many, many subtopics within it. Because gravity plays such a large role in everything, there are many equations that describe it in different scenarios. Let's take a look at that first equation you referred to. This is a depiction of center of gravity that's very different than gravity itself. The second equation is the standard calculation for the force of gravity. They are not depicting the same things. One is the center of gravity, one is the force of gravity. 
gravity. Do you know what the center of gravity is? Why do I even ask? Do you see the radius of the Earth anywhere in this one? Hmm. Well, this is the force of gravity. You know, that would be awfully suspicious if R in the previous equation you showed in a YouTube comment actually is the radius of the Earth. R is a variable that is commonly used to describe distance. Yes, it is used as radius sometimes, but not all of the time. Those two equations are exactly identical. Oh, then you have this thing right here, uh, and I'll read this to you. F grav represents the force of gravity between two objects. This little symbol here means proportional to proportional to, now we're going to read the top line, the mass of the object of the first object over the uh, times the mass of the second object divided by the distance separating the object centers. So what this is really saying is if you have the mass, which is just molecular weight, that's why I said peri periodic table. What? It's not molecular weight. That's not even close to being the same thing as the mass of an object. What? We're not talking about weights of individual molecules here. I mean, technically you could, but this equation would be absolutely useless in that scenario since gravity is such a weak force in the minuscule world of atoms. This equation of gravitational force is mostly used for celestial objects such as stars and planets. So let's take, let's say we take a gram of, um... Oh, I don't know, carbon, and put it next to a gram of helium. What do you think would happen? No one's going to use this equation for a gram of carbon and a gram of helium. In fact, no one's going to use this for a gram of anything. Their masses are too small to even be relevant. Instead, try the Earth and the Sun, or the Earth and the Moon. And even if we did use it for a gram of carbon and helium, that still wouldn't be molecular weight. It's saying that, see, this is really, it's proportional to the distance between them. So the closer you put that heal or the, that hydrogen to the carbon, the more they will attract. What utter bunk. Let's just pretend you actually have a middle school's knowledge of this equation and presented this with two massive objects like the Earth and the Sun. Yes, there would be an attractive force of gravity, which is stronger the closer together the Earth and the Sun are. Imagine it like a vacuum cleaner. If the object is far away, the vacuum cleaner's force on it would be so minuscule it wouldn't budge the object. However, if the object is right up to the machine, it would be sucked up easily, and the force of this sucking is inversely proportional to the distance, meaning the closer you are, the stronger the force. That's the same with gravity. Massive objects inherently have a sucking power, which although though as powerful, still doesn't suck as much as your video. Uh, uh, a fourth grader would take any two gases of different densities and realize how stupid that is. First of all, this is used for massive objects like the Earth, like I mentioned multiple times. Second of all, it has nothing to do with density, just mass. Okay, so now he goes on a little bit of a rant about Newton and Einstein, but I'm going to briefly skip that to get to the next juicy bit. So let's just take a look. He's going to take a bunch of marbles and he's going to throw them in two different directions on this gravity well and it's going to demonstrate how the gravity well causes these to accelerate as they come in decelerate as they go out and they actually they spiral into the center note the spiral here we go look at them spiraling in at all kind of different directions please note that they're not all going straight up and down it's not likely for an object to enter a larger object's range of gravitational pull directly, whereas angle of entry allows it to reach the center object directly in a straight line. It's much more likely for it to catch at an angle, since the field is much larger, and spiral inwards. See, when this happens, multiple forces are at play, namely the force of gravity and angular momentum. It's the same reason the moon orbits around the Earth. Gravity tries to pull it in, but the angular velocity opposes it. If gravity is stronger, the orbiting object will eventually spiral in and crash into the center object. If gravity is weaker, the object will travel further away until it leaves the range of gravitational pull. While this is happening, because of the nature of the forces, the object will orbit around the center. And that's what we see in the demonstration, in simple terms at least. There is absolutely no demonstration at all that we could show in space to say that this works. Absolutely none. Here is evidence that we have every night in our skies, when the moon's in our skies, that the gravity well BS is just that BS. Remember all those spiraling in? Okay? All those impacts from craters that were coming in because of the gravity well of the moon, right? Well, what do you notice here? Do you see any skid marks next to these craters? Hmm? Or did they all seem to impact straight up and down? Every single one of them. 
Okay, this argument has been debunked multiple times before. When meteors or asteroids crash into the moon and the earth, it doesn't skid. Maybe it's portrayed like that in movies and whatnot, but that's not what happens. What actually happens is that there is a large release of energy, which takes the form of an explosion. So when space rocks hit the surface of the moon, they explode, which results in the craters we see today. Literally, just enter your question into Google and you'll find your answer. That would have saved many people their brain cells. Anyway, that's the end of the video, guys. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you to Fireshard, Daniel Seibel, and Shere Khan for being the top patrons. I'll see you all next week.